Hello and welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today I'm joined by Art Lab. Art has a lot of experience building companies in Silicon Valley and then he started his own company which he successfully built and exited and he is now into online courses. Art is going to teach us a lot about how he learned from his failures and what other methods you can learn if you want to create a successful business. Hello and welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today I'm joined by Art Lapinch. I know Art from the ODCC cohort based course. Art is, has worked as a company builder. He then built his own remote company and exited it and is now working on his own course on uh, how you can make remote work work well for your company. So welcome Art. Thanks Tom for having me. Yeah, so I'm very curious to hear about your background, your whole learning journey. So maybe let's just start at the beginning. I think the first thing you did was, was work at a, at a company builder. Now I didn't know what that was initially. So can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So roughly 10, 11 years ago, I was still living in Vienna and then stumbled into the startup ecosystem, started with organizing startup events, particularly weekends, weekend events where people would come together work on ideas and pitch it in front of investors. And then the next obvious step for us was to create a startup conference. And it was like relatively big back, back in the day, like, so 2011, we had 800 participants from all over Europe coming to Vienna for an entire week. And it was like a mixture between a startup competition, but also expert panels, you know, sharing their lessons learned. And like during those two years, I really fell in love with the startup ecosystem, mainly because I saw that a little shit like me was able to talk with people who have really achieved great things on eye level. And I really just like the people who are working in the startup ecosystem. So that's why I stuck with it. And then moving away from Vienna, which is my hometown, I moved to Berlin. That was around 2012 and I joined a company called Hitfox Group. So they are currently named Ionic Group and they are a company builder. So what's a company builder? It is similar to a venture funds. So they have their own, uh, small pool of money. And what they do is they look at different markets. So in our case, it was advertising technology and they form hypotheses and it's kind of like business plans. So they say, oh, we see that there is a certain trend going on in mobile advertising, that there's more mobile games coming up. And one of the bottlenecks for mobile games is distribution. So then. What they would do is they would create a business plan for that, kind of like starting a mobile ad network. They would collect a group of founders and then fund them with initial set of money and then push them off. And my role within this structure was something called a venture developer. So venture developers were, I'd say business generalists usually who has the task to take these business plans. And within the time span of usually three months, come up with the, you know, first, first step on the ladder of building a company. So kind of like the back office would take care of incorporation, but the venture developers would uh, be responsible for hiring the co-founders, for hiring the first employees, for getting the sales and marketing kickstarted, sometimes even the kind of like the first iteration of the product. And yeah, that's what I've done then for this company builder for two and a half years, I think. Right. Yeah. So one interesting thing you mentioned about the whole startup ecosystem is how easy it is to yeah, get access to people who have achieved great things. You have some examples of how that has helped you, uh, maybe learn some things fast and achieve certain goals that you thought would be unattainable for a little shit like you. Yeah. Examples. I mean, the examples are everywhere, right? I, I just compare it to friends who are working, let's say in, in traditional corporate careers where you have to really put in the years until you're taken seriously. And back then, kind of like in the startup ecosystem, we, we had a couple of people in Vienna who are currently running a venture fund called speed invest. And they were one of the first kind of founding teams back in the mid 2000s who exited a telco and tech company. And so those people were just like sitting down at the table and sharing their stories and talking to people who were you know, 19, 20, 21 years old, which is amazing because I just couldn't see the same thing happening with the corporate leaders. Maybe I'm mistaken, but yeah, that, that was my impression back in the day. And in terms of learning, yeah, I mean, 
I, I think you have, you learn primarily by making your own mistakes. So even if someone tells you focus on the customer and focus on the problem first, and then build the product based on the customer problem, you're probably listening there, taking your notes, but the first few times you'll still focus on the product and yeah, probably lose sight of the customer problem. Yeah, I, I definitely can relate to that. So, so yeah, then at some point you started with some co-founders, I believe, building your own company. So how did that go? And what initial mistakes did you make and what did you learn from that? Yeah. So that's fast forwarding to 2015. At that time I was living in San Francisco, also working for the company builder and the area of focus shifted from ad tech to FinTech I, I did venture development for four projects. And at some point, yeah, I, I was just asking myself a question, you know, do I want to try and yeah, give it a go on my own outside of a company builder structure. And the, the reason why I was thinking that was because within the company builder, you have certain advantages. So kind of there's a safety net to get a fixed salary. There's like a back office that takes care of things such as accounting, incorporate taxation, yada, yada, yada. But they also take a majority stake of the, the venture. And so that's kind of the, the upside is primarily for the venture builder, but you get the stability. And one thing I just wanted to experience was the no support system and try it on your own. And I talked to a couple of friends, told them effectively, yeah, if there's anyone in their circle of friends who is starting a business and who needs support, I'm happy to do it after my working hours and yeah, help them out. And so one of my friends whom I funnily enough interviewed for one of the positions for our company builder, and he was saying, oh, actually I am working on a business idea. So he invited me over, we had a whiteboarding session and there was a couple of different trends or like different problem areas that we had to look at. So one of them was, I think what's currently known as class pass. So it's kind of bundling supply of gyms and fitness, fitness providers, and then selling it's to the demand side as a subscription model that was going through the roof in the U S and we were considering maybe taking that to Europe. And then the other problem set that we looked at was recruitment. So kind of, it came from the hunch that if you would walk down a street in San Francisco, you would see every single restaurant just having small window signs where it would say now hiring. And we're just like thinking, okay, so how, how are companies currently hiring? What's the main channel? It was Craigslist and it still is Craigslist for a lot of businesses. And if you look at Craigslist, the, 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 the website hasn't been updated since the like late nineties, I guess, or like early two thousands, whenever they were started and everyone hates the interface, but everyone's using it. And they were back then, I think grossing 200 million dollars a year in recruitment marketing ad spend. And we said, okay, we want to have a chunk of that. So we'll go after a chunk of this. Initially, the, the first business idea was we wanted to create a Tinder like app where you would have a card based system and kind of as the employer, you would upload your job ad or your job opening with kind of a couple of structured data points, such as like, which street is it at? Um, what's the title of the job? What's the hourly rate? And so on and so forth. And then for the job seeker side, you would just open the app and uh, it would take your geolocation and send you job openings that are close by to you. So you would just like swipe through left. I don't like the job, right? I like the job immediately apply. That was the idea. And we worked on this idea for a year and a half and turns out selling software or selling new solutions to small and medium sized businesses is a pain. They just don't want to deal with additional complexity. They usually don't have the budgets to really spend and at max they hire, let's say 10 to 25 employees a year. So even if you get someone signed up, the, the revenue potential is very, very limited. And of course, if you would have properly talked to customers and I guess that, that was my responsibility right at the beginning. I didn't know how to ask the right questions. I should have read the mom test, but Rob Fitzpatrick probably a little bit earlier. We could have avoided this mistake, but so we spent a year and a half and we had like a small friends and family angel investing rounds early on. And we spend literally the entire money on 
two designers and developers who were developing this product. And we tossed it away after a year and a half. So that was a huge mistake because we were, we were just like in the wrong direction. And we got very, very lucky that one of our features for this product was the idea that if you have an app, you need to grow the app somehow, right? And there's like one way of doing like paid app advertising, and that's very, very expensive. So back in the day, you would just like buy a mobile and download mobile app, download ad on Facebook, I think. And the costs there were somewhere around like three to $5 per download, which is pretty expensive. And instead, what we wanted to do is we wanted to go the Indeed route and for every job, job opening that's being uploaded to our platform, just create a website, which is then indexed, and then you can increase SEO density and then ideally get organic traffic. If people look for jobs in the area, then funnel them to the app and get them signed up there. So it turns out we never published this feature within the context of the app. But uh, we got lucky and one of our first big clients, which is a ride sharing company in the US, they said, oh, this sounds like a feature that we need because we need to hire thousands of drivers all across the country um, every single month. And a feature like this, which is pretty much automated distribution of our job ads is something that we currently don't have. And we lucked out that we said, Forget about the sun costs. We'll toss away the app and we'll just focus on this distribution of backend service. And yeah, then within a couple of weeks, we had a pretty significant amount of media revenue running through this platform. And we said, that's it. So when you see it, you know it. And we definitely knew that was kind of like end of 2016. And then from then on, we were on path to. Yeah, it's becoming a real company. So I guess the, the big mistake we made early on was just executing in a completely wrong direction, not really validating if there was a like real demand and also, I guess, being a little bit blinded by the, the, the excitement of building a specific type of products, but then kind of not really looking at the fundamentals of kind of what it would mean for a business model. And the learning was, yeah, if you see an opportunity, then jump on it. So that's it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's you, you, well, you, re you rec recognized your mistakes and then you needed some, some work, of course, but at that point, I guess you were able to scale the company. So how did that next phase, when, once you got a real company, how did that differ from the initial experimentation phase and was your learning process there different or was it the same? You still made mistakes and learned by that, or was it more structured? always make mistakes. Uh, it continues to this day. So yeah, I don't know. It's like entrepreneurship in general feels to me like solving new problems every single day. And of course you will make mistakes and you're constantly in an area where you don't know the answer. So you have to somehow try to be less wrong at, at every single step. And that's in every single aspect of the business model, the product development, the internal organization, how you interact with your employees. And so I'd say like one of the really significant differences from the early stage, which was 2015, 2016, when it was startup and startup, I would define as an organization that's still looking for a scalable and successful business model. Right. And then once you have that, right. you switch over to becoming more of a company, which is more predictable and can be run with a replicatable business model. So in the startup phase, since we didn't earn revenue, we also couldn't pay salaries. So all of the founders were kind of living off of their own savings for two years and anyone else kind of like contractors we pay. So those were the, 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 this couple of, of product designers and product developers, and then everyone else would be compensated in equity promises, right? And there is only so long someone can go without saying, oh, okay. I trust you, but then at some point it's probably, I think these shares are probably worth nothing. And especially more difficult if you have a family, if your significant other is pushing and asking like, what the hell are you doing? Like, why are you spending so much time on something that doesn't really have a, um, good return. And so in the early days we had incredible turnover. I think at some point I counted in, in the, in the first two years, I think it must've been 20 to 30 people 
who have gone in and out of the organization and that's not good for organizational culture and just in general, right? Like it's, it's a lot of time waste on everyone's behalf. And I would say that was the biggest difference that changed. So once we were able to pay salaries, we were pretty, pretty focused on hiring the correct people and big shout outs to my co-founders, Eric Spencer and Mike, who did the bulk of the hiring because we hired primarily on engineering fronts and I'm not an engineer, so I <laughs> couldn't really evaluate people on their, on, on their skills. But once we hired people, we had barely any false positives. So very few people that entered the door, which we had to let go, I think like one or two. And secondly, out of all the people who joined, we had zero people leaving up until the acquisition happened. And that's one of the things that I'm most proud of. It's like revenue is nice, becoming profitable is nice. But the fact that people wanted to work for this company was something that was really exciting. And I guess one of the reasons why probably is because we were set up as a remote first company. And that's already since the beginning in 2015, kind of the, the original reason why we decided to go remote first is because we just couldn't afford the developer salaries in San Francisco and we had to look outside. And so a couple of former coworkers of two of my co-founders were living in Germany. And so we started hiring in Germany and then one person in Singapore and so on and so on. So kind of, we had a distributed workforce from day one. And I guess from an employee perspective, like why this is interesting is because back in the day, you wouldn't have that many options to work for a company where you could stay at home, where you wouldn't have to commute and could stay with family. And so I think the average age of our employee base was I think mid thirties. And most of the people had some sort of, uh, family ties where it was like parents that they needed to care for or kids that were going to school. And yeah, I guess people really appreciated the flexibility. And then since it was a pretty interesting group of people in terms of combination of like where they were coming from and so on, what we tried to do is on a quarterly basis, just to do team offsites where we would fly everyone into one city. We would book an Airbnb and then work on one core initiative, but primarily the, the, the focus was just to get to know the people and yeah, I think the, the cohesion of the team was pretty big. So by the time we got acquired, I think it was 15 employees and that's an interesting company size because you know, every single person, it's so few people that you can even go deep with every single person and yeah, it worked in this context. Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess that's the basis of your, of the work you're doing now. But one interesting thing that you mentioned before, I think was that you're always in an unknown area and you have to try to figure that out as an entrepreneur. So have you found any hacks or shortcuts, like, I don't know, having mentors or following the relevant people to yeah, discover what to do in an unknown position, in a known area and past? Yeah. So I guess there's two ways you can spin the unknown classification. So one is unknown to you, but known to some other people. And that's the benefit of Google and Twitter is that within a couple searches, you can open up doors into rabbit holes that you can follow and where you can, you know, just try to understand a little bit more um, about this industry, this problem from the perspective of different people. So, um, threads and yeah, threads weren't really a thing back in the day, but what helped me the most was just going onto Google and looking at blog posts from people who have sorry, the business. So for example, when we try to figure out how to create a global compensation plan that was compliant with the regulations in the U.S., but also in other countries, one thing that really helped was all the writing that buffer.com did. And so it's a company that does a social media management tool and they, they've been very transparent about how they run their organization for many, many years. So this was super, super helpful. I guess on the other bucket, which is unknown to everyone. So let's say one example is creator business models, right? So what do you do if you're a solo founder 
And if you want to monetize your knowledge, yes, there's maybe some examples, some examples that are doing it well, but it is still a greenfield opportunity. It's like more about figuring it out. And for those cases in general, probably helps to have kind of guiding principles or just figuring out like what your convictions are, kind of like how you want to constrain yourself. I'll give you an example. For business models, you can, I, I can do consulting. I can do online courses. I can create SaaS. I can do many things. And one of the constraints that I put on myself is I want to limit the time inputs that I have to do in order to generate value. So kind of consulting is lower ranked for me than uh, scalable online courses and building micro SaaS. And so I guess for, for those cases, you just have to figure out like, what are the options within the pool and then pick proper constraints. So, and then just experiments, right? So it's like, even if you hear something smart from someone else, uh, it won't stick until you have burned your own fingers. Yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned about guiding principles and I know you talked before as well about having a, a personal advisory board. So how do you go about picking your principles or picking the people on your board and how do you decide whether to maybe discard somebody or replace it with something new that you. Personal advisory board. So I, I have an imaginary advisory board. <laughs> it's, a, it's a notion page where uh, there are a couple of names of people. So one of that was Richard Feynman as a great physicist, and I am just trying to write down kind of the main principles that I think I learned through them. So I've read a bunch of books uh, of his, read a couple of his lectures and kind of my main takeaway from him is teaching by analogy, teaching by metaphor. So simplifying things. And I don't know the person personally, he's dead, unfortunately. And I didn't have access to him, but sometimes just having a, a piece of paper or something where you can just like cross reference. And then it's almost like a checklist going through. It's like, am I trying to, have I tried simplifying this or have I tried explaining this with a metaphor? So that would be kind of the advice that he, I think he would give me. And so I have a couple of names on there in terms of real mentors. I don't have a mentor relationship right now, like when I was working at the company builder, usually my bosses and my, my co-founders acted sort of as mentors in areas that I didn't know as much about. And it's, it's, I think it's in general, a good practice of getting out of your head and then verbalizing things or getting just a second or third opinion. The one thing that's important is just make a distinction for yourself as to why is the person saying what they are saying? So like, what's their context? Do they have, like, what's their previous experience? So let's say someone who gives me advice about fundraising and who has previously built only hyper growth companies and has raised hundreds of millions of dollars will probably have a very, very different take on fundraising than an indie hacker who has always bootstrapped and done the work. And so kind of whatever I'm saying right now comes from the context of someone who has been an employee in a venture, uh, uh, an adventure builder and has started a company that was bootstrapped primarily and remote first. And that's my set of experiences. So kind of, if I were to give advice to someone who's trying to create the fastest growing comp venture capital, probably not the right person to talk to. And so again, that, that's the way I would just evaluate the, the feedback that I get. Good teacher of mine from grad school said every, every opinion is valuable enough to be heard, at least for the benefit of you to understanding like where they're coming from. And exactly that way I would just go about mentoring and mentorship advice. Yeah, that makes sense. It's almost like the challenge is finding somebody who's on the same path that I had. Yeah. And so kind of a couple of close friends from Austria still that are also founders, they're working in different industries. And one of the things that one of them was talking about that he really likes peer groups. Um, and so he's been a CEO and founder of a SaaS startup. Now he's a C-level executive also at a SaaS and data company. And he said the, the main benefit of being within these peer groups is that one, it's always 
context specific. So all of the people in that group usually are working in the same industry and also in similar positions and similarly sized organizations. So the problems tend to be very similar. And there's a one common thing or like one very obvious thing that you would do when you have a problem is you ask your family, your significant others or your friends and they care for you. And I think that can also be a problem because you have this additional personal context of where they maybe don't want to hurt you or they talk to you in a specific way, like whatever the, the relationship was previously. So kind of having a more objective and more context specific feedback is, is good. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I guess that one of the challenges is actually fine. Yes. There's more and more com communities that offer that. For sure. Yeah. I think the benefit of Twitter is that you can find people online that have a similar affinity to you, right? Who, who consume the same type of media, maybe like we're, um, at a similar stage of their development and chances are that if you're looking for advice and you're in, in certain position, there's at least someone else on the internet who is doing the same. And I think Twitter, definitely a bubble, right? So it's a very specific group of people that's on Twitter, but if you are working in tech, there's a high volume of very interesting people on there that are willing to connect. So I'm not sure if it is as relevant for many other industries. I'm just not sure because I am not in those industries and I don't know. But for tech, I think it's a pretty powerful tool. Twitter is kind of what I would like LinkedIn to be. And it's mainly kind of, you get clout by saying smart fit things or, or writing threads. And yes, a lot of it is formulaic and <laughs> there's also sometimes very little originality in the thinking, but you can still find people who are doing crazy shit and just connect with them. Yeah, definitely. Twitter is, uh, Twitter is cool. Though so it's, uh, yeah, it can be tough, but it definitely has a lot of. Mm -hmm. So I thought I actually talked with Hassan Kuba on a podcast a few days ago, like he wrote about the unfair advantage. It almost seems to me like the unfair advantage you identified like for you is remote work and you made that the basis for your next project. Is that kind of how it went or, how, or what was your peak? Yeah, it just happened organically. So unfair advantage is a, is a, I haven't read the book, but my assumption is kind of like find asymmetries where you have more leverage than other people. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I guess remotes is something that I've been exposed to before COVID and it's a couple of years earlier than that. So when I remember telling people in 2015 that it was work from home, people thought I was unemployed and now my favorite thing is just like in January, 2020, you would hear exact at large companies saying, okay, remote doesn't work at the scale of our business. And then in April, 2020, LinkedIn would be flooded with thought leadership articles of kind of 12 things we did to master the pandemic or how to turn the, yeah, th this challenge into an opportunity. So how did it happen? So right now, just for context, I started a company in June called remotefabric.com. And the initial idea was just to create one online course about remote work. And earlier this year, actually, I, I wanted to take a sabbatical. I, I left the, the job that I had in December of last year. My plan was to do nothing for a year. And then after a month, I just got sucked into online education. Like first through the perspective of a student, I was doing course era courses. And then I took this Gumroad course by this Indian guy called Pritam Nath, and he has a fantastic Gumroad course called Programmatic SEO. It's just a two hour recording of him being in Chrome, installing a couple of plugins. One of them is called Keyword Everywhere and just showing how he goes about identifying keyword opportunities that you can use to create content strategy or even for ad buying. So super, super valuable course. I paid, I think like 29 bucks back in the day. It took him probably, to, yep, took him two hours to just like sit down at the computer and just talk through the stuff that he's doing anyway. And it was like a win-win situation. So he captured value by providing this knowledge and I gladly paid it and got tremendous value out of it. So I thought at the end of this course, hmm, very interesting because number one is the 
business model is pretty clear. So you sell knowledge of a product or so you, you sell knowledge as a product. So kind of you don't have to put in any manual effort in replicating this. So you can either record a video or you can write an ebook or you can write an online email based course. And secondly, the, the business model makes a lot of sense. So kind of, if you don't have to put in manual effort, you sell, let's say hundred licenses at uh, $29, that should be $2,900, right? And it's for doing nothing. So it captured my attention and I said, hmm, maybe this year I'll just experiment in this area. Online education is anyway, kind of an area that I'm excited about for many, many years, but I haven't found kind of like a proper business model to doing it. And this seems like the first time where I can see myself doing it. And so then I started creating an online course about brand strategy. So it's like one of the things that I'm really passionate about that I've taught to many people in the past, launched it, didn't really make a lot of sales, but it was, it was a good learning experience to just like seeing what it takes to structure a curriculum, like how to record video. I remember the, the, the first recording I was sitting in front of the webcam I don't know, for hours and not really getting a proper take in. And I thought, okay, this is never going to work. And since I was interested in the area, I said, okay, there's this online cohort called on the course creators. That's like where we, we met. And that was my first exposure. And so within on deck, my, my goal was first to connect with a couple of people like you who are on a similar path, kind of, so you can share learnings, teach each other. Secondly, to learn a little bit more about the craft of making courses. And the third thing was I wanted to figure out what the next product could be. And one of the cool things about Undug was that we had the opportunity to present in front of others, right? Like these, I don't remember what it was called, but the student sessions. I don't remember yet, but yeah. I don't yeah. But it's yeah. The 30 minutes where you just send a, a title, people can sign up for the session and then usually I don't know, 10 to 20 people show up and you have a quick presentation done a Q and A. And I remember also part of the on the cohort, he said, you know what, instead of doing a 30 minute presentation, kind of like 25 minutes presentation, five minutes Q and A, just do 10 minute presentation and 20 minutes Q and A. And that was one of the best pieces of advice, uh, I ever received. So then I just made a high level presentation of some of the areas of learning for remote work and yeah, presented it. And one of the areas that people were most excited about, or like most curious about was how communication works in a remote first company. So how does knowledge sharing, knowledge storage, how does like, what different channels can you use? And that was the topic of internal communication. And then I said, I will do a couple of office hours, uh, about this broader topic and just do every two weeks, a new subset event uh, where people can sign up and ask questions. And so that I did that for, I don't know, five events, so like three months. And the one thing that stood out was documentation. So people were most interested about documentation. That's like where I had the best content and yep. Then I started putting together a curriculum. And so I initially thought I would be done writing this email based course in a month. It turns out it took more than half a year and yeah, now I finished writing it two weeks ago. So is it an unfair advantage that I have maybe, but yeah, the, the current product is definitely the result of almost an entire year of additional iteration. So I couldn't have written the, or I couldn't have produced the, 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 the online course that I'm currently offering earlier this year. Impossible. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. And yeah, it always takes much more work than like all most of the work is invisible, right? Just mm -hmm. publish something and that's easy money, but a lot of. Yeah. And in, in general, kind of, are there things I would do differently now? Yes, I guess so. I would always try to validate interest in the product as early as possible. And yeah, a bunch of people have written about it. There's the lean startup, the blog, everyone keeps saying, yeah, I try to charge before you even build, but yeah, I've heard this advice for the past 10 years. And it's going to, if you're in the middle of building out of projects, you tend to forget. So I don't even know if this is advice that I would give 
people will just figure it out on their own. Yeah, and I made that mistake. A lot of times I probably did it, did it right for the first time last week when I gauged interest uh, for a certain content piece on Reddit, then well, it got traction. So now I'm actually building that content. So that's, that's, that's like the first time I do it. What type of content was it? So that's actually a template for learning a language. So yeah, first it's going to be a general template and I'm thinking I had this will probably be like language specific as well. For example, Chinese, Portuguese, other languages that I've learned. Yeah, it's basically rather than a course that just teaches you a language, it's more like a, a bit more meta and actually teaches you how do I go about learning. Reminds me a little bit of that blog post, or I think a chapter from Tim Ferriss and the four hour chef, where it talks about picking up languages and how it's, how he goes about first going through the list of, you know, the, the top 100 words or like most used words in the language, then taking the auxiliary verb approach where you just use the auxiliary verb and then don't have to learn conjugation of verbs and so on. So definitely a super interesting, super interesting area. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. So one, one of the interesting uh, responses I got from that Reddit to Ferris language advice is a piece of shit, and that should definitely be not be in a template. So <laughs> that will be, that'll be very interesting to see how that turns out. Super interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, so you're doing it right. So with the, I guess like with the online courses thing is, I guess I could have figured out the remote stuff earlier on, but in, in February, when I started on this online course creation journey, I wanted to ship an end result within a month. And I didn't think I had the right content and the right knowledge to put something good out about remote work for a month. People might say, you know, even if you think it's not going to be good enough, just do it. And then you'll learn in the process and then you iterate. But with brand strategy, I just had already kind of like a rough outline. I knew kind of what needed to be done. And that's why I shipped it first. And I guess like the one thing that I would do differently probably is even start distributing this idea or my, my idea of doing this project a little bit earlier on, on Reddit. Yeah. I don't know. Like one thing that was really, really helpful in the process was building in public and I'm not a Twitter expert. So like earlier this year, I reacted, not reactivated my account, but kind of started using it again after five years of not doing anything with it. And there was kind of a couple of people who had this hashtag built in public and they were just sharing everything they were doing about the project. So kind of all the failures, like how much revenue they were making, kind of questions they, they were asking. And so I documented the building of the brand strategy course in the Twitter thread. So every single time I would have just like a new thing that I would ship something new, I would just yeah put a tweet out, maybe a photo, and then just kind of a small note of what's, what was going on. And the interesting thing here is it's, yep, it is educational for people who read the thread, but to me, it was super useful whenever I was sharing something and people were commenting on it and saying, there's a different way you can do it or maybe you're missing something. And that was super helpful because it's very specific feedback to a problem that you have right now. And just like by putting it out in the open, you then just create an additional opportunity for learning. So that was pretty helpful. Yeah. Building a public can definitely be, well, I try to do it more consistently as well. It's hard, I think, to, to keep it up consistently, but when you do it definitely has a lot of. It's... Yeah. The easiest thing. For me, it's just creating a first, a first tweet, regardless what it is. It can be like a screenshot, just like some sort of high level explanation of what it is, and then just continue writing it below it because the, the perfect thread or so, I mean, who cares, probably doesn't even exist, but you can, um, at least you know, always just add to the chain of things that you've done. It's just like almost kind of the next page in your notebook and kind of if you use it that way, I don't know, felt kind of okay. Yeah. And so maybe I know you use a uh, notion a lot, so maybe since I'm working on a tool as well for like learning knowledge and yeah, you talked about using Twitter as a tool. So how do you view tools in the area of knowledge management and to learn new things? I mean, like what have you found to work well? What would you like to see what maybe doesn't even exist yet? 
you know, the holy grail tooling questions, I guess. Some days, somebody who I interview will tell me the answer. Yeah. I don't know. So I'm always cautious about this because at least like from my experience and kind of like the context where I'm coming from, I probably tried many dozens of different tools over the past 15 years and nothing stuck with me, nothing, no, no habits, no tool, no nothing. So it's just constantly evolving. Maybe that's just a, yeah, I don't know, like a problem of my brain, but yeah, I, I can just tell you like what I used maybe two years ago and what I'm using now. So two years ago, I was on Evernote and Evernote I've used like for the past 15 years, the way I just use it is kind of as a browser accessible notebook. And every single day I wake up, I just create a new entry in my daily logs and I just write the date on it, what day of the week it is, what year it is. And then at the end, I write tada list. So instead of writing a to-do list of what I have to do, it, I just use it as a log of things that I complete. So at the beginning of the day, it's completely empty. And when I finish something, I just add it to the list. And that way, if I look back and know what I've done on that particular day. So that's helpful. It was also super helpful for work because that way I could, at the end of the week, if I do kind of like a weekly summary, I don't have to look into emails or anything. I can just look at the data lists and then come up with a quick update. So Notion, I started using earlier this year and first time around when I used it, I dismissed it a little bit because I thought, ha, huh, it's, it's similar to Evernote and it just like has a couple more types of content that you can embed. So can, you can embed YouTube videos. That's nice, but it's like really making such a big difference until I understood kind of how relational databases work and how you can build your own database of knowledge. And that was super helpful. I'm teaching that also kind of in the remote knowledge documentation course, like how to set up your own relational database for your organization so that your institutional knowledge is properly, properly accessible and can be edited in an effective and efficient way. And if it can be done for an organization, it can also be done for an individual. So the way I structure my notion, notion spaces is I have kind of like a high level database, which includes three sections. So these are three tables. One is projects, so kind of anything with a end states and kind of like, which is kind of timely bound. The second is areas and products. And so areas and products is something like health is an area, wealth is an area, learning and development is an area. And so these serve primarily as primary keys or tags for the third section. The third section are resources. Resources is just, um, let's say if I were to set up a podcast tomorrow, I would probably create a resource called podcasting and I would just put all the information that I have into this, into this resource. And this resource I would then tag to an area, which is called maybe creativity or business or whatever. And the interesting thing is, is like, you can tag resources to multiple areas if it's relevant. And so that's the way how I currently organize it for me. I don't know if it's the, the, the best thing in the world, but it works for me. Yeah, it's definitely very powerful. Yeah. Relational database can set up business processes. Yeah. Like, I mean, for knowledge basis, I use obviously my own app, but uh, for anything else to do with business and processes, I can definitely recommend Notion as well. Yeah, cool. It gives a uh, yeah, very good overview of uh, what, what you're doing and how you're doing it. So I guess to wrap up a bit, like, who would you like to see next on the like, podcast? Great question. Did you have Paula Crone on? I didn't actually. My, one of my favorite people on the internet. Great. Such, such, such a great dude. I mean, like one thing that the reason I'm saying Paula Cronus, because in, on, on Twitter, uh, you see a lot of creators or a lot of voices converging and using similar formulas and, you know, writing threads, doing certain types of messages, like the Q and a style, Paul doesn't give a fuck. And he is, he likes weird shit and he posts about weird shit and it's amazing. He's just like being himself. So I would say have him on, uh, pretty, pretty widely read from what I can tell. He has his own podcast where he's interviewed say close to a hundred people already now. Great conversation. And yeah, he, he also has to constantly learn about 
new people and new areas in order to be able to hold the conversation. So I guess he would be my recommendation for you. Awesome. Get in touch with you. All right. So thanks a lot, Art, for being on a podcast. And if people want to find out about you, about what you are currently doing, follow you, uh, what's the best way for them to reach? Yeah, I guess most active I'm on Twitter. Uh, the, the handle is at Art LaPinch. It's A-R-T-L-A-P-I-N-S-C-H, Art LaPinch. Then I have a website called artlapinch.com. It's very, very similar where I write long forum blog posts about stuff I'm learning. So kind of how the, on the course creator community was, how, for example, the, the experience was to build the remote first company. I also have a long blog post about it. For example, how it was to create and produce a music album. And then I guess for, for anything related to remote, uh, remote work knowledge and the online course, the website is called remotefabric.com. Just like remote and it's the fabric of your clothes. So remotefabric.com. Yeah. Thanks, man. Cool. Thanks for having me on, man.